Kwame Nkrumah went from a poor family to become a lecturer at Lincoln University. He led the Gold Coast, modern Ghana, to become the first African country to gain independence from colonial rule. He survived five assassination attempts on his life and became co-president of Guinea after he was overthrown in Ghana. He inspired many Africans to fight for freedom and independence. He believed that the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Stay tuned for the story of one of the greatest African leaders of all time. Welcome to African Dream Motivation. Kwame Nkrumah was born to a poor and illiterate family in Ghana on September 21st, 1901. His father did not live with the family since he was working as a goldsmith elsewhere. Nkrumah was raised by his mother and his extended family who lived together in a traditional household. He grew up in a village, and as a child, he lived a carefree life and was usually on the farm or by the sea. He was the only child of his mother, and he was so dear to her. At the time of his birth, the British were now assuming full control of the Gold Coast, and education was not something people felt the need to involve their children. Nkrumah's mother did otherwise and enrolled his son to be educated. He was appointed a teacher at the college seminary at Emisano in 1925. Back in his high school days at Achimota, he was inspired by a speech from a journalist by name Namdi Azikiwe. Eventually, both men met and Azikiwe's influence made Nkrumah interested in black nationalism. Namdi Azikiwe later became the president of Nigeria in 1963. Later on, Nkrumah decided to further his education. Azikiwe had attended Lincoln University, a historically black college in Chester County, Pennsylvania. He inspired Nkrumah to also enroll there. Nkrumah tried London University instead, but unfortunately, he failed the entrance examination. He sent Lincoln University a letter noting that his application had been pending for more than a year. He followed it up and arrived in New York in October 1935. He then traveled to Pennsylvania and fortunately, he had an entry into Lincoln University. He didn't have enough money to take care of himself, but he was determined to succeed academically no matter what life threw at him. He did odd jobs to survive, including being a dishwasher. On Sundays, he visited black Presbyterian churches in Philadelphia and New York. Since he was a devoted Christian, he completed a Bachelor of Art degree in Economics and Sociology in 1939 and was appointed as an assistant lecturer in philosophy at Lincoln University. While lecturing at Lincoln University, he received invitations to be a guest preacher at Presbyterian churches of Philadelphia and New York. He went on to do his master's degree. At the university, he was actively engaging organized groups of expatriate African students in Pennsylvania, which later became the African Students Association of America and Canada. He became the president of the group. Nkrumah spent his time organizing political conferences and seminars in mostly Europe and America. He met George Padmore, who was a journalist, and together with other Pan-Africanists, 
they organized the fifth pan-african congress in manchester from 15th to the 19th of october 1945 the African dream was brought back alive and the idea of the United States of Africa was born. The goal was to bring Africa under one umbrella and work towards the decolonization of the continent. They agreed to get rid of tribalism and rule within a communist or socialist system. It was a great conference and the spirits of the attendees were uplifted so high. Among them were W.E. Du Bois an American Pan-Africanist, and other African revolutionary leaders who later became pivotal in their country's independence, including Hashten Banda of Nyasaland, now Malawi, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and Obafemi Awolowo of Nigeria. In 1947, the first official political party in the Gold Coast, United Gold Coast Convention, was established. The leading members of the party were successful professionals who couldn't make the needed time to actively run the day-to-day -day operations of the party. Therefore, they needed a helping hand whom they would pay to run the party. Akwe J, a a founding member of the UGCC, suggested Nkrumah to be the ideal man to steer the affairs of the party. Nkrumah initially denied the offer but accepted it later on after thinking it through and realizing how much it will position him in African politics. He left Liverpool for Ghana in November 1947 to become the General Secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention. The supporters of UGCC grew exponentially through Nkrumah and the British colonial government saw the threat and was planning to get them under their control or even end the revolution. Even though Britain was politically advanced in the Gold Coast than other West African colonies, the tension of dissatisfaction was rising among the people. Farmers were angry at colonial authorities for destroying cocoa trees, slightly exhibiting swollen shoe disease, but still capable of yielding crops. Ex-servicemen who were employed to fight in the World War II for Britain were starving due to unpaid salaries and allowances as promised. People took to the streets to protest and the unrest grew as the days went by. The tension led to the 1948 Accra riots which escalated the strife in the Gold Coast. Three ex-servicemen, namely Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Tipu and Private Odate Lamte were killed and 60 others were injured. The colonial government charged the UGCC as responsible for the unrest and arrested six leaders including Kwame Nkrumah and J.B. Dankwa. The other members of the Big Six blamed Nkrumah for the riots and also their arrest. Gradually, their relationship began drifting apart and Nkrumah knew he would possibly depart the UGCC. Supporters of Nkrumah and the other freedom fighters planned to storm the prison and break them out. When the British learned of the plot, they separated the six with Nkrumah sent to a prison in Laura. The protests continued and pressure from international organizations and countries forced their release in April 1948. Upon their release, Nkrumah realized that many students and teachers who demonstrated for their release had been suspended. Nkrumah used his own funds to build the Ghana National College to accommodate such students and teachers. During these periods, Nkrumah's ideology fell on the hearts of the people and he was trusted to win freedom for the people of Gold Coast. From April 1949, the supporters of Nkrumah put pressure on him to leave the UGCC and form his own political party. On 12 June 1949, he announced the formation of the Convention People's Party. With the British experimenting with new ways to end the tension in Gold Coast, they selected a committee of middle-class Africans, including all members of the Big Six, 
except in Chroma, to draft a new constitution that will give the Gold Coast more self-government. Before the selected commission could begin work, Nkrumah reported that the recommendation will fall short by full domain status and began to organize a positive action campaign. He argued that a true representation of the people through an elected majority must instead write the new constitution. His words and ideas were rubbished and general strikes began on 8 January 1950. The strike quickly turned violent, which led to the arrest of Nkrumah and other CPP members on 22 January 1950. Nkrumah was sentenced to a total of three years in prison and was incarcerated with common criminals in Accra's Fort James. His assistant, Komla Agbeli Bedema, took over and ran the party in his absence. Nkrumah still managed to influence how his party, CPP, was run while in prison. He influenced events by writing notes on toilet papers and smuggling them out through visitors. The British prepared an election for Gold Coast under the new constitution. Even though Nkrumah was in prison, he insisted that his party would contest in all seats. Nkrumah contested from prison for Accra seats. In the February 1951 legislation election, the CPP, led by Nkrumah who was in prison, won 34 seats of the 38 seats contested on a party basis. Nkrumah was also elected for Accra constituency. The UGCC won three seats, and the one seat left was taken by an independent candidate. The massive win for CPP caused the release of Nkrumah from prison on 12 February 1951. The following day, the British governor of Gold Coast, Sir Charles Adinclair, sent for Nkrumah and asked him to form a government. It was a long struggle for Nkrumah, but after all the ups and downs, his dream was materializing. He formed his government and then he was named the Prime Minister of the Gold Coast in 1952. In 1956, another election was held and the result was just a copy of the previous one, indicating Nkrumah's significance in the Gold Coast. Before the Gold Coast was declared independent, Nkrumah proposed that the independent Gold Coast should be named after the old Ghana Empire, which existed from the 3rd century to the 12th century, at present-day southeastern Mauritania and western Mali, which is the origin of most ethnic groups in the Gold Coast. On 3rd August 1956, the assembly voted in acceptance of Nkrumah's proposed name, and Ghana became the independent Gold Coast.
He retained the position of Prime Minister after the Declaration of Independence on 6th March 1957. It was around this time Nkrumah decided to get married. He wanted to marry an Egyptian, so he sent his friend Alaji Saleh, who was one of the first Ghanaians to study in Egypt, to find him a Christian wife. Fatia was one of the final five women chosen, and without holding anything back, Nkrumah proposed to her. Even though her mother was reluctant to accept or bless the marriage, Nkrumah married her at the Christian Bell Castle on New Year's Eve in 1957, upon her arrival in Ghana. In 1960, Ghanaians approved a new constitution and elected Nkrumah as president. Ghana was now a republic. Nkrumah became the first prime minister and president of Ghana making Ghana the first sub-Saharan country to gain independence from colonial rule. He went on to push for the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, which later became the African Union. This was a strategy to unify Africa and then fight for independence for the whole continent. Under Nkrumah, Ghana played a major role in inspiring African countries to fight for independence. He preached unity wherever he went, and he was the greatest icon of African freedom in the mid-20th century. Nkrumah embarked on a great developmental projects in Ghana, ranging from educational institutions through industries, self-sustaining economic reforms, and many more. The development of Ghana was soaring high at an incremental pace. He was loved by many people in Ghana, Africa, and the world at large. Nevertheless, his way of governance posed a threat to some world superpowers, including the United States. With that in mind, he was very cautious with his international dealings with them. In 1964, Nkrumah pioneered a constitutional amendment that made Ghana a one-party state with him as president for life of both the nation and its party. Everything he did, he thought he had the support of his party members and believed they were all working towards the betterment of Ghana. But that was not the case. Even within his party, CPP, and his close friends, he had a lot of enemies. As the old Ghanaian proverb says, if a bird stays too long on a tree, it invites a stone. By 1966, Nkrumah had gained an enviable reputation in Africa and the world at large, receiving the honor of Lenin Peace Prize from the Soviet Union in 1962 and other reputable accolades. During his presidency, he survived five assassination attempts on his life, including the use of bombs and shootings at close range. After he survived all these attacks, the phrase, Nkrumah never dies, was born. In February 1966, Nkrumah was on a state visit to China and Vietnam. He was on a mission to help end the Vietnam War. In his absence, he was overthrown in what was considered a violent coup d'etat led by the national military and the police forces with the backing of some civil servants. The coup was led by Joseph Atta Ankara with the support of some CPP top officials, including K. A. Buzia, who later became the Prime Minister. He did not even hear of the coup until he reached China. His friends easily betrayed him and collapsed his party. Prisoners were free to make space for people who were still loyal to Nkrumah. It was indeed a violent takeover. His wife, Fatia Nkrumah, fled the country with their children to Egypt. Nkrumah went into exile for the rest of his life and never returned to Ghana. He was well received in Guinea and lived in Conakry. The then president of Guinea, Ahmed Seko Touré, made Nkrumah an honorary co-president of Guinea as he continued to push his vision for African unity. While in exile in Guinea, 
He did a lot of writing, reading, gardening, and receiving guests. All this while, he feared his assassination and abduction and was very cautious in whatever he did. He suspected that the United States of America, through their CIA office in Accra, were behind the coup d'etat that kicked him out of Ghana. Living in Guinea, he still felt threatened by Western intelligence agencies. One day, his cook died mysteriously, and after that, he feared greatly that he might be poisoned, and therefore, he began hoarding food in his room. In August 1971, he flew to Bucharest, Romania, for medical treatment as his health was in a bad shape. Unfortunately, his health never got better. He died of prostate cancer in April 1972 at the age of 62 in Romania. His death came as a shock to the whole world. Major news outlets in the world broadcasted the news and it was a sad moment for Africa. His burial became a rift between Ghana and Guinea. Guinea claimed that Ghana rejected the noble leader but they took him in and made him co-president. For that reason, he would be buried in Guinea. They went on to bury Nkrumah in Guinea in May 1972. In fine, we have gathered here to set forth his brilliant light, to dispel darkness in the lives of all who are oppressed, suppressed, and distressed by racial discrimination, segregation, and colonialism, and to mourn the loss of a fallen hero who was an indefatigable and gallant indomitable fighter for the great cause of Africa. Honor! Gloire! Victoire! Vive la Révolution! After serious tensions between Ghana and Guinea, President Ahmed Seko Touré later opened negotiation with Ghana's President Colonel Ignatius Kutu Echampo. He laid out certain requirements which had to be met before he releases the body of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah to his native people. Before Ghana's request would be granted, Nkrumah must be restored and be recognized as a former president. Every honor due a head of state must be given to his burial. All his supporters detained in Ghana must be freed. Ban on the return of his exiled supporters must be lifted. An agreement was finally reached and Nkrumah's body was returned to Ghana for another burial. Kwame Nkrumah was buried in his hometown at Nkrofu. President Kutu Echampon failed to honor his words and sadly, Nkrumah did not receive the befitting burial the world yearned for. In 1992, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings presided over a befitting state burial for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. This was the third and final burial of Nkrumah and many hailed President J.J. Rawlings for making it possible after almost two decades. On this 32nd anniversary of Ghana's Republic Day, we are laying Dr. Nkrumah's remains to rest at the site of his greatest triumph. his lifetime, his ideologies inspired many countries around the world. He received many honorary doctorate degrees from highly reputable universities worldwide, including Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, Moscow State University, Cairo University, Egypt, 
Jagiellonian University, Poland, and Humboldt University, East Germany. In 2000, he was voted African Man of the Millennium by listeners of the BBC World Service, being described by the BBC as a hero of independence and an international symbol of freedom as the leader of the first black African country to shake off the chains of colonial rule. According to the intelligence documents released by the U.S. Department of State Office of the Historian, Nkrumah was doing more to undermine U.S. government's interests than any other black African. Nkrumah was the greatest African leader in the era of decolonization of Africa during the mid-20th century. He preached unity as the only way Africa can win the battle against colonialism and Western influence. Many people died fighting for freedom, hoping that one day Africa will rise again. Nkrumah did his part and left an outstanding legacy of promoting African unity and encouraging self-governance. Whoever you are, whatever color your skin is, whatever language you speak, and wherever you find yourself, always remember that we are one people, and as Nkrumah said, the forces that unite us are intrinsic and greater than the superimposed influences that keep us apart. Unity is the key to build a new Africa we hope to give our children. If Nkrumah could go from being born into a poor family in the Gold Coast to break the resistance of colonialism, there is nothing impossible under the sun. Africa will forever remember his great contribution to the growth of the continent. By far, he is one of the greatest African leaders who ever lived. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, kindly like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you don't miss any new video we upload.